Backend keywords are the things that Amazon's search algorithm will pick up and use to see if their a product matches the search that a customer is doing. So at a minimum, are there backend keywords? And then are they the ones that are relevant for that product and the ones that customers would use? So we would do that audit. This is the e-commerce brain trust, a podcast about building momentum online for established consumer brands. Join our hosts and their expert guests for high level conversations about e-commerce strategies, trends, and innovations. Access our brain trust and boost your brand's e-commerce potential. Hello and welcome to the e-commerce brain trust podcast. I am your host, Kiri Masters, and I'm joined by your co-host, Julie Spear. Hi everyone. Hi, Kiri. Hi. So Julie, we're a few episodes in now. What do you feel about this whole podcasting game? It's a whole new world for me. I've always been a leisure listener of podcasts (laughs) for entertainment and for information, but it's fun being on this other side and it's a good chance to kind of dig deep on topics that we encounter and take a look at on a day-to-day basis. Um, Mm. It's fun to take a step back and look at it from at a deeper level and just from like an information share perspective. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know what they say, those who can't do teach. And I definitely feel that way when we got on the mic today and I didn't have my headphone plugged into the microphone. So it took about 15 (laughs) minutes of troubleshooting. (laughs) It wasn't a control alt delete solution. (laughs) That's my go-to. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad we're here. And I'm glad today we're talking about vendor central optimization. And we've talked about the differences between the vendor platform and the seller platform in some previous episodes. And in this one, we're, we're actually diving deep with a subject matter expert on our team, Noel Barnes, to talk about vendor central and how brands can maximize that platform. Yeah, it's a great topic. Noel has good insights that she shares with everyone. And I think you know, it's a good FAQ kind of resource Mm. for people considering getting into vendor. Just Mm. she offers some good points about things to consider and things to keep in mind as you venture into a vendor relationship. And then it also, she also offers some good housekeeping tips for those that are vendors, things that you need to be paying attention to, to make sure you're a healthy seller on Amazon. Yeah, definitely. She's really a wealth of knowledge. And so the the reason why we chose this topic as something to talk about on the podcast is because there is, from my perspective, a lot less information about how to optimize a vendor relationship with Amazon compared to Seller Central and FBA, where there is boatloads and boatloads of information out there online. Some of it is helpful and good quality, some of it's not, but there just isn't really a whole lot of guidance and clear recommendations about how to manage a vendor account from a optimization, compliance, and marketing standpoint. No, there definitely is an information gap there. And then even when you're looking at the two platforms, comparing Seller Central and Vendor Central, when you look in a Seller Central account, I think navigating it is much more intuitive. It's a lot more Mm -hmm. straightforward, even though you can run into hiccups here and there. Vendor as a platform itself is not as intuitive. So while there's an, a lack of information as in terms of resources online for vendors, it's also a little bit of a clunkier platform to navigate mm-hmm. and know where to look for certain things. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, without further ado, let's get into the interview with Noelle. And Julie and I will be back after the interview to talk about some key takeaways from the episode. Great. So thank you for joining me, Noelle. I'm really excited to dig into more of the details around how we optimize accounts at Bobsled Marketing for vendors and all of the opportunities that you frequently run across when you're you're helping to strategize and implement things on accounts that require more control or looking to grow an account, looking to get it in front of more consumers. So to start with, Could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to arrive at Bobsled? Sure. So uh, I have been in Seattle for the better part of 20 years, and many of those years have been spent in the tech industry with nine years at Amazon, actually. So I started at Amazon when it was still a relatively small company. It was back in 2003, and they were just launching in Canada. So that was my first job. I was the merchandising manager for Amazon Canada. 
And I started ostensibly as the book's merchandising manager, but then moved into software, video games, movies, and music because they just didn't have anyone else to do those things. And that's Amazon. They say, well, you know, we have no one to do this. So just go figure it out. And that's a very Amazon way of doing things. And it was a blast. I had a great time. We, I did that for a couple of years and then moved on to the magazines team you know, where they were figuring out how to sell subscriptions, both print and digital and how to track subscriptions. And they were working with all the different publishers. And then Amazon's always innovative that way. They always try and figure out better ways to do things on behalf of customers, which is great. And then magazines moved into Kindle. So I found myself in the Kindle ecosystem for a while. And then that moved into a desire to work back in video because I really liked movies and, and TV shows. And so I went into this tiny little team called Amazon Instant Video, which turned into Prime Instant Video while I was there. And that was a really big project. And I worked with some of the heavy hitters at Amazon there. So I've worked in mostly media, always in digital marketing always focusing on how do we sell products to the right customers within Amazon. Mm. And that was always a passion of mine was trying to find those customers because there's an awful lot of customers who come to Amazon every day, as you can probably imagine. And Butter is trying to put the right products in front of the right customers in very targeted ways. Mm. And so trying to identify how to do that on a daily basis was really exciting to me because we had email at our disposal. We had site merchandising. We had Amazon's algorithms, which even the people that created those algorithms wouldn't tell you as an Amazon employee what drove those algorithms. They were very cagey about it. It was very secret sauce. So it was really fun to be there and watch the, the company grow exponentially in the nine years that I was there. By the time I left in 2012, it was a completely different place. I bet. Than when I, when I started. Yeah. So, um, so since then, I've been, I've been revolving around the company, but working with people that I worked with while I was there at Rhapsody and a couple of other places. And then most recently, I, I teamed up with a friend of mine who bought a company that wanted to sell on Amazon. And we had a really good time getting back into the swing of things with Amazon and, and learning how to sell through Seller Central, actually. And then I started working with you guys at Bobsled. And it's been great to just learn more about Seller Central versus Vendor Express versus Vendor Central and seeing how Amazon has positioned itself. And, and ways to sell products and how brands have different choices now on how to sell products. Right. Yeah, definitely an interesting journey. And something that you said that I wanted to pick up on is the fact that there's millions of people shopping on Amazon every day. And so mm -hmm. how do you get the right product in front of the right person? And Amazon has reams and reams of information about every customer a small fraction of that they decide to sell to share with sellers and vendors. <laughs> that's now a big part of what you do at Bobsled is looking at it from the vendor's standpoint how and all the tools available to a vendor. How do they find the right customer at the right time at the right price and, and mm -hmm. make that offer attractive to them? Right. And the flip side is managing that vendor's relationship with Amazon as well. So they've got two customers to deal with. Yes. And they're very much the intermediary, right? And I think there's a lot of things they can do well in that position. And there's a lot of ways that Amazon can make their lives harder. And so it's it's up to us at Bobsled to try and help them with that relationship because Amazon ultimately, you know, they, they are there for the customers and they're also there to make a profit. And so the vendors often get caught in the crossfire between those two extremes. Right. Yeah. And so that, that was my first question for you really is about what kind of mistakes vendors make when it comes to managing their Amazon channel? Well, certainly on the, when, they're, when they're signed up as a vendor, there are a few things that I think, a few themes that I've seen over and over again through the course of many years, not just uh, working with Bobsled, but certainly things that have evolved over time. One is a big one, which is they forget that they have any control over their pricing. They really don't. You know, Once you've signed up as a vendor, the thing that you leave on the table is, is your pricing. And so if you want to control your pricing, don't be a vendor with Amazon because you can complain about your pricing, but only it's up to Amazon to determine what your pricing is going to be. And I've seen vendors who some of their products are being sold at MSRP and some are being sold below cost. Mm. And it's this very interesting wide swath of pricing and it, and both are equally frustrating, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you don't want pricing that's at MSRP because that hurts sales and you don't want it below cost because that hurts map. And so it's this very strange dichotomy of pricing and it, and and the reps sometimes don't respond at all because mm. it's a pricing issue. So that can be hard. I think uh, a couple other things that we try and encourage vendors to think about is, you know, if they, if they don't have that ARA premium, that really expensive package for data, and they're not collecting their data often, they lose data. And so that's something we try and do at Bob, at Bob Sled is always collect data on a weekly basis because otherwise you lose the ability to see data in terms of in certain timeframes. And what type of data, what type of important data are vendors losing when they don't track it? 
if they want to see things on a weekly basis, for example, unless you go in every week and pull a report, you can't really see that, especially for product level data. So there's things like that. Like there are, I've seen, you know, vendors who have the basic package. There's all kinds of reports that you can't pull if you don't actually go in there on a regular basis and download them. So we, we do that for our clients on a weekly basis. We pull reports at, at the, at the SKU level and also at the higher level is on a monthly basis later. Um, and that same goes for things like AMS, for example. AMS has terrible reporting, quite frankly. And that's the advertising that you get as a vendor. And so it's it's a little odd that Seller Central in some ways has better reporting than Vendor Central. Yeah. More more malleable report, you know. Well, I think it it shows you where they're strategically where they're going in terms of making the self-serve options a lot more attractive and accessible and promoting those a lot more than than the relationships that brands would previously have with buyers. That's true. That's very true. I think, I think that's, it is interesting to me, you know, one, one thing to consider is, you know, we have these, a couple of my clients have these reps where one rep is really responsive and the other rep is, you know, this other client just can't get on the radar of their reps. And I think, you know, if you assume that your rep will always get back to you, like Q4 is dauntingly busy for anybody who works at Amazon. And so, you know, if you're, if you're really reliant on your rep for any sort of movement on your account, that is, that's a risk, right? And so Seller Central in some ways is better because it's so self-service and even Vendor Express has some, has some self-service aspects to it. Vendor Central is definitely, I I wonder what it will look like in five years simply because I'm not sure how much Amazon's going to invest in the the headcount going forward for for people like reps, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So. Yeah, we did a, a whole episode on the vendor slash seller hybrid model, talking about kind of mm-hmm. the pros and cons of both both channels. And that is why we, you know, for vendor clients, we often do talk with them about setting up a seller account just because of the additional control that they can get from it. Right. It's a good backup. It's a really good backup. And then also, you know, there's two other things that, that come to mind is one is just not paying enough attention to operational metrics. We've seen that really hurt a client's vendor account. But then the other thing too that's that's a little wonky is that I have and I've I've had this happen as a customer and I've had issues with a couple of clients is where they they want they don't want to go through the hassle of introducing a new ASIN because they're they're making changes to an existing product. So rather than introducing a new ASIN just to an existing ASIN. And so as a customer, if you go back and you want to order another version or another, a a copy of an existing one, like I ordered a pillow recently and I was so excited to get this pillow because I loved the pillow I had, but I just kind of worn it out. And I ordered the same Mm. pillow from my order history. Yeah. It was a different pillow. And, but it was the same vendor. And somehow Amazon didn't clue into the fact that even though the pillow was physically different, the weight was different. I compared it to the old the old item. And so somehow, you know, because Amazon has made the process of introducing a new ASIN for certain categories so onerous that it's it's hard and it takes a while because of hazmat and other issues. You know, it's made it's made clients or it's made vendors gun shy about actually introducing new products on Amazon. And so the, unfortunately that has made them not want to do it. So they make they make changes to existing ASINs and that can make a whole host of bad bad decision making <laughs> that goes mm. makes a chain that, that eventually impacts customers and that creates a higher defect rate for the product that yep. shutting down the product for a while. So yeah. It's a pickle. Right. It's a hard situation to be in. Hundred percent. Those are my greatest hits for huh. mistakes. <laughs> what are the first things you look for when you get into a vendor account and you're looking for opportunities to either grow grow sales in the catalog or through promotions, advertising? Or even just, you mentioned general account health and the health of products and those kind of product assortment hygiene issues. What are your, the first things you'd look for? Well, we do, there's sort of a customer facing version of that and there's a back end version. So the, the, I'll start with the customer facing part. So we really look at the listings and see how we can optimize them. And there's some very basic things that we would look at initially. Are there back end keywords on the listings? So the back end keywords are the things that Amazon search algorithm will pick up and, and use to see if their product matches the search that a customer is doing. So at a minimum, are there back end keywords? And then are they the ones that are relevant for that camp, for that product and the ones that customers would use? So we would do that audit. Do the titles accurately describe the products? 
because sometimes we find products that don't really have the best titles that don't really describe the product. So we would go through and just make sure that the titles look correct and don't have any spelling errors, those kinds of things. Are the bullet points clear and consistent? Are they are they concise? Because there has been this trend on Amazon lately to, to load those bullet points with as much text as possible. Oh, yeah. Yep. And while, while that is you know interesting from a keyword perspective, I guarantee you customers don't read those bullet points. And it's prime selling space that is being wasted because people have gotten too overzealous with filling them with keywords. But that's where your selling message is. It's just below the image. You have a title, image, and bullets in the top, the, above the fold space on the, on the right. page. You don't want to overfill that. So that's where customers will find out the most about your product. So don't overwhelm them. So th- those are the kinds of things we look for initially on the listing. And then, you know, advertising, what's happening there? So are they using AMS? Are they using everything that they can to their advantage? And so we do a quick audit there to see, you know, what have they been doing? Have they been spending too much? Are they being efficient with their advertising spend? So those are the customer facing items. And then on the back end, yes, are there operational metrics and account health issues that we need to intervene on right away? So is there anything that's above the thresholds that Amazon stipulates? So compliance, are there things that we need to look at and intervene on right away, charge backs, those kinds of things. Um, anything that can hurt the account longer term, because what you don't want is for the account to be suspended because of issues that the, the client didn't know about or wasn't paying attention to. So we, we jump on those kinds of things right away. Right. And yeah, so let's talk for a second about things like chargebacks and those compliance related issues. What is sort of some worst case scenarios that you've run across or, or heard about anecdotally where vendors who, who are on Amazon and not paying particularly close attention to what's going on might be, might be unaware of? Fortunately, because I have a great team at my back, we don't have had this happen to us. But I do know, directly during my time at Amazon, there were issues where a client, for example, just wasn't paying attention to POs, for example. And so you had a, a long list of POs where they weren't sending in product that matched the POs. At some point, you have to deliver a message as an Amazon person. You have to deliver a message to that vendor that they're not meeting their their contract, basically. Yes. And so the contract stipulation is, you know, Amazon sends them a PO, they fulfill that PO, or they cancel it, or they change it. And yep. so yep. the systems are better now, where it's I think it's clearer for a vendor to see what Amazon is asking for, and to either meet that requirement, or cancel it, or to change it. I think if vendors don't pay enough attention to what Amazon's asking for, it throws a monkey wrench into the system and then your metrics suffer as a result. What you do is have those metrics suffer because then there are downstream impacts to that. So if your account gets into bad standing, ultimately, I think it's harder later on for you to have better terms when you have to renegotiate terms. And so keeping all of your metrics at the 0% mark or you know below the thresholds is really good for your later ability to negotiate good terms with Amazon. So I would encourage everybody who that you have as pure and clean operational metrics as you can, because it's really important. That's both a stick and a carrot, because <laughs> the stick yes, is... It is. <laughs> If you don't stay within the lines, then you'll get your product shut down or, or you'll get kicked off or, you know, you'll eliminate an entire revenue stream being Amazon. And the carrot is if you play within the rules and you know what you're doing and you know what your what the hot buttons are for your Amazon buyer, then you can get a better deal the next year. So you're removing any leverage that they have to remove any good terms that you have. Right. Right. And so ultimately, if you're playing by the rules, there's no reason for them to have to remove any good terms you might have. Now, they may want to, for other reasons, change your terms and they have that right because they're Amazon. Yeah. But at least you have removed any sort of bad behavior on your part as one of the reasons. Right. Absolutely. So what are your closing tips to keep in Amazon's good graces overall while taking care of your bottom line as a vendor, which, as you mentioned at the beginning is is the dance that vendors have to have to do. Well, I think, you know, we've talked about a lot about this, but I think the stick in the carrot, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> come back to that. If I focusing on operational metrics are really important. So making a point of looking at that and just and you know, checking them a couple times a week and making sure everything looks consistent, looks good. And if it doesn't look good, try and understand why and what you can do about that to, to, to fix it. There's also on your home page in Vendor Central, there's this thing called business advisor. Not necessarily bad things. I think that business advisor can have some really interesting components, such as saving money by shipping things by pallet, for example, is a really intriguing possibility for some vendors. I've seen that pop up or increasing sales by doing a promotion. 
by lowering cost, those kinds of things. So I encourage people to look at Business Advisor on their homepage. And then my last and best piece of advice is in dealing with Amazon reps. So I would encourage everyone to remember that Amazon reps are the busiest people you're probably ever going to meet because they have more accounts than you can probably imagine. And so when you are communicating with your Amazon rep communications as short and concise and as simple to the point as you possibly can and incorporate data whenever you can, because then you're speaking their language. Yep. Give them the data that you need to make your point. Make sure it's in like chart or graph form or something that's really easy for them to digest. And then that back up, backs up your point so that they understand exactly what you're trying to say as quickly as possible and they can act on it from there so they don't have to go hunting around to understand what you mean. Easy for them to just to just, you know, sort of yay or nay your your proposal or your point and then just act on it. And again, Q4 is really, really hard. So if you don't get responses from your rep this time of year, don't be surprised because they're just underwater. Yeah, that's a real, that's a fantastic tip and good practice in general. But like you said, particularly when we're talking with, with vendor managers who are one off their feet. And one thing, one other thing I wanted to also call out, one of the topics that you've contributed to our blog recently, Noel, is about EDI, about electronic data integration. And this seems to me to be a big win for, for brands who are shipping large quantities products out and if they're still using a manual kind of system to receive in, to receive purchase orders, send invoices, track the shipments that they're actually sending out, then EDI mm-hmm. is a great opportunity to make sure that their purchase orders are filled correctly and that they're not going to get any kind yes. of chargebacks from Amazon for incorrectly filled POs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, EDI is a great win. If you if you can get your system on to EDI, it makes things so much easier because it just removes the possibility of human error. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's so much there. Amazon has been working on their EDI systems for, I think, as long as I've been on Amazon. And they, they first worked on it with publishers, if I remember correctly, because, you know, publishers are the ones sell- sending in the most stock. Mm. And so they have so many years of refining the system that if vendors can get their systems talking to Amazon through EDI, I think it makes, it's a win for everybody. It makes things so much easier. It's a hurdle and it requires some infrastructure changes and it probably requires an investment up front. But if you can do it, I think it's a, it's a win for everybody all around. Yeah. Maybe something that vendors want to drop to their vendor manager when it comes time to renegotiate their contracts for 2018. (laughs) It could be, yeah, you know, if it's something that, I mean, it, it's absolutely something that could help. I mean, it, it couldn't hurt, right, to, to bring it up, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Noelle, for sharing your knowledge and, and tips for vendors today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, and I wish everybody a great Q4. Well, that was a great interview. It was really interesting to hear Noelle's perspective of what vendors should be paying attention to in their accounts and things to keep in mind as they enter into a vendor relationship with Amazon. She offered some really helpful tips there. Yeah, absolutely. It's really important. Like we said at the top of the show, there isn't a whole lot of information out there for vendors. And that can be challenging when there is someone new at an organization coming in and trying to get their channel into line. And maybe the person who originally set up the account isn't around anymore, or you get an invite to the vendor central program and you don't really know what it means. So it's great to be able to start sharing some of our tips from Bobsled about how we work with clients, what we recommend there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the point, one of her points that she hit on right away was about really emphasizing that vendors have no control of their product pricing once they enter into a vendor agreement with Amazon. Mm-hmm. And I do think that that's a point of struggle for a lot of brands and vendors. Yeah. Understandably so. And it's really, I, I'm thinking back to our interview with Ken from Slice Intelligence about the five stages of grief where you of come grief? to, yeah, as related to selling on Amazon. And I do think you almost have to go through that process as a vendor where you come to terms with these are the realities of this arrangement that I have. And a major mm-hmm. piece of coming to, or a major topic where vendors need to come to terms is around the product pricing. You lose control of your product price, which is a really tricky, a tricky thing. It is. And it's fairly unique to the Amazon channel as well. And if your brand is set up as a wholesale with primarily a wholesale model, it's a new experience to be dealing with a a partner who is very opportunistic when it comes to, to pricing. And to be, to be clear, Amazon is, they're not pulling 
retail prices out of nowhere, really, just to be spiteful. They're actually, they're always scouring online sources, catalogs, wherever they can find the lowest price, because that is Amazon's brand promise to consumers. And so they're very opportunistic about finding the lowest price and matching that. So it does generally mean that if if you see a really low price on Amazon for your brand, that means that somewhere out there in the system, that price is, is already out there. So it can actually signal to a brand that there's other retailers and partners out there with a lower price. But still, it, it is very frustrating. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've always, I found it surprising instances. I think typically you think the instances where Amazon is listing well below MSRP, I have been surprised by instances where they're listing well above MSRP, which is, seems very counterintuitive, but it, that happens as well. So the, the fluctuation can happen in either direction. Right. And your dog just hates it. When I know. The price is he, <laughs> he has strong feelings about Amazon and pricing. He really does. <laughs> Especially as it relates to his dog food. <laughs> He's really keeping an eye on the family budget there. That's really he is. He is. I, got, I have backup with Jack. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> yeah. You know, another thing that I really took away from the episode with Noel is definitely your mileage may vary when it comes to dealing with your vendor manager or or buyer at Amazon. And like Noelle said, some are super engaged, others are are not. And you have to understand that it's kind of a function of Amazon is generally moving towards a self-service model across the board, wherever possible. We see that in ads. We see that with the seller central and FBA platforms being a lot more self-serve and a lot more robust than the vendor vendor platforms because I think, you know, Amazon makes more money off it. They want to be as automated as possible. They really like to, where possible, make things as efficient and keep the humans away from the keyboards as much as possible if, if they can. So these vendor representatives or vendor managers, they have a huge, huge quantity of brands that they're dealing with. And so just that they don't have a whole lot of time to to be dealing with with each vendor separately. Yeah, the time factor is a piece of it, as well as your vendor rep can change. <laughs> oh yeah, so many times in the course of your your selling on Amazon, mm. so that's actually a real challenge that some brands deal with as well. Mm. I liked Noelle's point a lot about make your communication with your vendor rep count. Get to the point, use data, Amazon loves data, and mm. make your case with the numbers. The other mm. thing that I've always, I've talked about as a good strategy is pointing out how whatever you're addressing is, is a win-win. It's a win for you as the vendor, and it's a win for Amazon as well. Amazon wants, you know, they want to know what they're going to get out of, whatever your request might be. So that's another thing to, to keep in mind when you're considering strategy for dealing with your vendor rep or addressing issues and negotiating with Amazon. Yeah, absolutely. There was a, just to point listeners over to another podcast that's really helpful in this topic, understanding how things work inside Amazon on the vendor side. We'll link to it in the show notes, but it's an interview that Ken Kassar from Slice Intelligence did with Melissa Burdick, who is an ex-Amazonian and and helps vendors these days as well. And so she gave a lot of really great insights into just how stretched the vendor managers are and, and how Amazon is really trying to move towards automation and how that really plays out in your relationship with them. So we'll link up to that episode in the show notes as well. Mm, yeah, that would be a good resource to share. Yeah. Any other takeaways from this interview with Noelle, Julie? The, only, the other takeaway that, that she emphasized a number of times, and I, th- I think it is really important to underscore, I'll underscore it one more time for her, is to pay mm. attention to your operational metrics. You want mm. to keep your account healthy. If you want to sell on Amazon, you need to meet their metrics. You need to meet the standards that they have identified. And so it's important that you're checking your vendor account, you're making sure that you're addressing chargebacks or PO issues or whatever it might be in order to keep yourself healthy and able to sell on Amazon. Yeah, absolutely. And that is just getting your hands dirty, doing the work consistently and making it part of a brand's weekly, daily workflow. Yes, exactly. Great. Well, thank you for coming on to help wrap up this episode, Julie, and your takeaways, and we'll catch you next week. Sounds great. Thanks, Gary. 